is so I'm going to answer your question anecdotically. There was an article in the New York Times about that very recently. If you want to work in this company, where you should go. And the one that you have to remember is Apple, Duke. And of course, the top three people at Apple are all Dukies. And that might uh, basically have something to do, but it was by far the university you should go if you want to work at Apple. According to the New York Times, which I'm going to tell you now, that you shouldn't believe anything they say. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Because that's what uh, my thought should be. So what we think I can do uh, for you, and this uh, uh, actually David's uh, lecture was very good, because most of us cannot do what David wants to do and what LinkedIn uh, wants to do. So, what's the goal? The goal is from, basically, go from data to information, from information to decisions. <laughs> And um, some of my, I'm going to talk about some of what we're doing, but also want to basically give a lot of warnings. So we used to have data, and, and we were all happy people. I started at academia about 20 years ago, and, and we only had one image to work with, and her name is Lina. Um, and she was a favorite model, and everybody used that image, and everybody was happy, uh, because you could compress Lina, and you published papers, and that was first of all, pretty offensive to a lot of people, uh, which I agree, it should have never been the standard image. Somehow we became, she was not offended by that, but, uh, but that's the only image we had, so we had data. Then we started to have a lot of data, and then we started to be a bit scared, uh, because now we have to compress a lot of images, and not just one. Uh, which, by the way, to compress one image takes one bit to say the image, and that's all. So then the data actually comes in different forms. <coughs> and it comes a camouflage, the, like data is trying to do that here. And it also comes in different versions. It's this data and data with a friend and connections, like, like David was saying before. It's not just the data. And the fun of data is uh, in, in areas like David was saying, is not to infer the obvious, it's to infer the non-obvious parts of the data. And uh, from data, we want to get the information. This is something that people confuse a lot. Uh, 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 and we can take uh, the, the mathematical terms of that. And the next step is basically from the data, we have to make decisions. Okay? And decisions come with the task. And I'm going to do, be doing different things with data than Ingrid is going to be doing with exactly the same data, even if it has the same information, the same entropy. So, data without decisions is kind of a bit, uh, 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 basically, in the vacuum, because we all have decisions to make, okay? And it's very clear, Google has only one decision to make, how do I use your data to make more money? That's the only decision that most companies have, but it's not the same decision. So, David uh, has a decision, how do I use the data to publish a paper? Okay? It's a very different decision. LinkedIn couldn't care less about the paper. Their task is not paper. Their task is increase their money by the end. So it's very important to keep tasks in mind. And our vision in academia is try to develop universal mathematical tools that we can address those problems universal enough that we don't have to start again every time we have data, but non-universal enough that basically learn from the data. Because one of the mistakes that we often Doing academia, it's just, you know, we have a hammer and look for the name. And so we have to play with that compromise. And I think David was very clear in that. And so I'm going to talk in, in a few minutes about face recognition, but that's one type of data. So we have to develop tools to be able to deal with faces. Uh, another type of data is just 3D models. We have to develop, and hopefully we don't have to start again. And I'm picking examples that we, my group, are actually using very related tools. To, to address. Uh, you have to be, so those are different 3D models. Uh, David talked a lot about graphs, and it would be interesting for you, and I won't go into the mathematical details, that you can use the same mathematical tools to deal with graphs, and you can deal with three-dimensional models and with faces. Uh, and that's part of our goal, you know, to become an expert in Bayesian, and not just for the sake of it, because you believe that that actually applies to a very diverse type of data. Um, so you don't have, as I said, to start from, from scratch all the time. But, so we have all this data, and uh, once again, I'm going to pick on the New York 
Times because I read the New York Times, and every time I read the New York Times, I say, why do I read? <laughs> <laughs> because every time I understand something about the problem, they got it wrong. And the other day, it was also the economist was talking about AI and big data, and I said, boy, you should just do your homework before you are the economist and write an article on that. And the same is for New York Times. And I can say that 100% the right science that I understand are wrong. So if I extrapolate from that, I would assume they are 100% wrong in everything. But I keep reading it. I don't learn. Uh, so here is a relatively simple problem that the top algorithms to do object detection and object classification in image processing got it wrong. This is the top algorithm now that I have access. And if it's on the web, it's, it's actually beats everybody else in every competition. And this for everybody is a tiger. And this got, got it completely wrong. I know it's kind of a not a not normal, it's more a painting, but no human being uh, above the age of uh, three days will not say that this is a tiger or a horse, the age that they can communicate. But the computer has it wrong, according to New York Times, which has solved this problem over and over again. So here's another example, and you can read what it gets, but this is a cat. I mean, see, there's no confusion here. Then you can talk, it's a cat reflect on a surface all the way you want, but it's just a cat. Okay? And once again, the New York Times and the Economist was reporting last week that computers are outperforming humans on this type of task. And I said, you know, where did you read that? And I looked at the paper they read it, and the paper was as misleading as the article. And the paper came from, not LinkedIn, but the next one. <laughs> okay? And, and they basically were claiming we be humans, and then the New York Times and the economy speak on that. Uh, so, industry almost has it. And, and industry has an awesome job in many, many areas. But it's very important to keep that it's almost has it. So, you can go to industry and see really, really good examples of the use of data. And I'm just going to mention a couple that I just, just, just I think is fine. I think one of the most interesting examples that happened in recent years is Waze. Okay. Everybody knows what Waze is? So Waze is a tiny, tiny company that was created in Israel and sold for a billion dollars, uh, uh, 1.1 or something like that, to Google. And now everybody's using it because Google is powered by Waze. That it did the most, I think, the smartest thing that you can do for maps. You use people to understand traffic. Okay? So it's very simple. On Highway 40, you are allowed to drive at 60. If you track people and you see that they're driving at 20, something is going on wrong in that highway, and I don't have to send a Google car to find out. Okay? So all what you do is you become a Waze member, they made it as a game, and you use crowdsourcing and data to understand traffic situation. And of course, the moment they created that, there is a graduate at my alma mater that hacked them and can make them believe that this road is empty or full. <laughs> but, you know, that's part of big data, and those are part of the security and privacy questions. You know, you put a lot of smart people. But, but that's an idea of, of uh, you know, uh, big data. Uh, uh, Google came out uh, with a, a fantastic paper that they can recognize uh, house numbers in very, very strange situations, not clean house numbers that most of us have. And really, very, very, it's much more challenging than, than what we can think. And it actually works pretty well. Uh, Amazon does a recommender system. They claim it works well. I never bought a recommendation from Amazon, so I'm kind of surprised uh, by the recommendation. But they claim it works very well for them. And that's the, the use of big data. And it's related to what David was mentioning. And I'll talk about faces later on, and we all heard about uh, Google trying to do the knowledge graph, and Google search is certainly becoming better and better. And, and I, think, I think we all uh, basically are witnessing that. So if we have all these, these results, we might ask, are we there yet? And the, if you read on the weekend, the economies you know, are already starting to talk about AI and the computers taking over. And, and just basically, we're doomed, and we should be start packing and moving to Mars. Uh, so I don't think we're there yet. And I'm going to explain in the next couple of slides uh, why not. And I use this example because there was a big buzz in the, in the public uh, 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 press, in the popular press, that Microsoft came with this outstanding algorithm to distinguish a cat from a dog. Okay? And I find that I shouldn't. If I wrote that paper, I, if one of my students writes that paper, I would never publish it. <laughs> uh, but 
day I will tell you why in a second. So I think there is numerous challenges and I want to just give a warning about that before we, we give some examples. One of the big challenges for small people like me is that, and there is actually a lab at Cornell that is called Small Day. And, I, and I, I, I like a lot of the work of the leader of that lab. Most of us don't have. So a Facebook trained a neural net to do face identification to distinguish between two people, to basically say if these two people are the same or not. And most people don't read the details unless you have a student work on that. They use 20 million samples and several weeks of training to basically say if these two persons are the same or not. I don't find that extremely exciting because most of us, I mean, I think it's a great advance, but most of us don't have access. I want to basically learn what David wants to learn uh, just with 10 companies and infer much more of that. Data is expensive for most of us. So the N equal 1 is a big challenge. Uh, uh, basically, as it's, the other problem is that very often we make life-changing decisions. So I show you the example and why object recognition, face recognition is a great business for companies like Google or Facebook. They're not landing a plane, okay? They're just telling you, helping you to automatically label the pictures of your friends. If they make a mistake, if they make too many mistakes, you shut off that app. And if you guys remember the clip from Microsoft Word, Microsoft didn't go bankruptcy because of that. We just did stop using it because it wasn't helpful, okay? So they have almost zero risk in what they're doing. And many of us have life, so if you talk with the Department of Defense, they are very concerned about neural networks because the results are unpredictable. The mistakes are unpredictable. And uh, uh, Amon Sheshua is the CEO or, or, or the chief scientist of the leading company in automatic driving. And one of the things that they're putting in the market is automatic stopping, basically in front of a pedestrian. And he gave a fantastic talk that he said the only problem here is false positive. Everything else is easy. You cannot make one mistake because then you stop at 65 miles an hour in the middle of the highway. Okay, mistakes is what companies like Facebook and Google don't have such risk. A self-driving company, if there was just a, a basic flying bird and you're driving 65 miles an hour and automatically stops, you just kill a lot of people. Okay, so that's, and, and his lecture is all about false positives basically mistakes, not about making it right. And uh, uh, basically, a lot of times we have adverse data. Although companies like Facebook and Google and LinkedIn have their competitors putting adverse data on them, I don't falsify my profile on purpose on LinkedIn. People do lie about their age, so they get different marketing issues, so I get tired of getting, you know, they basic pills for my memory, so I go and say I'm 20, so they don't send me those <coughs> advertisements. But most of us don't lie on those things. A lot of the data out there, you actually have people that are basically against you. And that particular insecurity application happens a lot. So the, the environments are dynamic, multimodal. There's many, many challenges. And I think that data is expensive in many scenarios. And the other part is that sometimes the hardware, for those of you that work on hardware, changing hardware is very hard. So you have the same hardware, the, the, basically the data uses are different. So that's why, uh, and the natural query systems is something that big companies are working. So I think every industry is different, and we have to be a bit careful that what we hear that Google has solved might not help for your industry. So my, I think that every company has to live their own. That means this is my pitch, so you go and hire all our students. That basically you cannot, you can trust some of what's done out there, but, uh, but basically you have to live your own research because every company has, has different needs. Having given you all those warnings, which I hope I, I, I told you, basically I explained to you how to be skeptical next time you read the New York Times or The Economist. And, and basically, there has been a lot of progress in the community, some shocking progress, actually. And I want to mention a few of them. Uh, so, 
face identification, and as I say, it's working pretty well, and I'm going to mention this because it's something that we've been working on our group. So the basic idea is that you want to, there is a, a, a lot of work on either recognizing people or basically detecting if these two people, if these two persons are the same. I briefly mentioned before, what you find in the literature today, if you read the fine print, is with millions and millions or tens of millions of training data and weeks and weeks of supercomputers that we don't have. Just, that's why you hear those results only from Google and Facebook. They're fighting each other who gets the best result. And they're the only ones that their data is private. So I don't even know if what they're reporting is, is right or not because nobody can, can validate as academics. We are very concerned about that. So we want to get away, and I, I just want to say, you know, whatever you can do here, you have to think twice. This is kind of the, the motus in, in, in our group. Maybe for training, you can train on a desktop, but after that, when you're working, this guy is as powerful as, so those of you that are younger than me don't remember, but it used to be a, a supercomputer company called Craig. They went under with the same power that iPhone Okay, when they went bankers. Okay, so this is a supercomputer in your pocket. Okay, if you don't, if you can't do what you want to do in this supercomputer, you have to redesign your library. That's my, my, that's why I have it forced my students. No, it doesn't work for everything, but, but most consumers will have to do that. So we've been designing uh, uh, things that basically train in a few minutes on a desktop computer. Uh, we train with about 6,000 examples instead of 20 million. And, and we basically give you back results in about 30 uh, microseconds or, or, or less, uh, depending on what you want. And we're actually going to demo to a security company on Thursday in this. And one of the scenarios that we are look, we're, uh, looking at is the blacklist scenario, where basically there's a few people that enter at the airport, and you want to know if they're in your blacklist. So basically, you're getting feed cameras, and, and the crazy idea I have in hand is that basically every security officer in the airport has a, an iPhone or, or something like that, and then they're basically able to detect. I actually been a kind of a thinking, and let me just uh, finish putting this. So we get state-of-the-art results with much less data. That's a challenge. The challenge is not, oh, Facebook got 97%. How do I get 98%? We're going to the other direction. They got 97% with 20 million and supercomputers for two weeks. Can I get to 95% on a, lab, a desktop? And basically in a few minutes. And, and we show that we can. And one of the things I've been telling the security people is that, you know, our system you can put inside every single play. The last place where passengers go, which one is? The plane. So it's absolutely nonsense, in my view, that there's no security in the entrance of the plane. Where everybody's marching in line, it's the easiest plane to do security in the entire earth. It's just a tube. Everybody's marching in line and looking up. Just take a picture, you run this, and you detect it. And this costs nothing, because it can run in your local computer. They're not going to do that. They're not telling me, but they told me they're not doing that. Uh, so, as I said, there is decent object recognition in the literature. Uh, basically, unless you go to crazy things, there, there is surprising. There is now a demo online by, by Torab at MIT where you upload uh, scenes. They say you take a picture of this and we tell you a lecture talk. And it's, it's pretty surprising for standard. Once again, if you don't care about the 1% of mistakes, they're, they're nonsense. But if you don't care about that, it's, it's actually very, very decent. Uh, uh, work. So, I can show you what we've been doing on that, uh, just trying to make things very easy. Either put a picture and get words, or you can go the other way around and put words and get pictures. The other things that we're doing a lot in, in our group, and has been advanced a lot, is on, on basically detecting emotions and expressions <coughs> from faces. Uh, we're working a lot uh, on this for behavioral analysis, mostly for children. And, and it's pretty, pretty advanced, so we can try, we're actually running this on a pediatric clinic with basically no problems. And, and that's a very challenging scenario because we have no control. And that's a lot of what image processing has been moving towards, is getting out of the lab. And, and this is running on an iPad. 
basically. Actually, now it's running here. I have a demo here if you want to see this. Okay? So, that's it. As I said, we're, we're already running in the clinic. We can do it in 3D. We can do it uh, basically position independent. And, and that's once again the challenge is to make it be cheap. <coughs> this actually is harder to explain than what it is. Uh, but it goes the same. So, so he's sitting there and basically gazing right and left. And, and once again, uh, I'm just going to run this again. So the graph shows, uh, if you look at his eyes and you look at the graph, he is gazing left and right. So he's here. Uh, oh no, he was, I was, a, sorry, I was at a different lecture in the morning by a candidate and he was there. So what's the difference between that and anything else uh, in the literature is the same concept. This can be done through a company that's called Toby that has complete control of the market and it costs $150,000 that device to do gaze tracking. This is done with a $9 device in our lab. Okay, so $9. I'm not allowed to say that it costs $9, but it costs $9. <laughs> okay? It's a, in that real sense, a three-dimensional camera that is going almost in every lab. It costs less than $20 for action. Okay, so if you are Google, you will get it for less than $20. If you are a regular consumer, you go out and you buy it for, I think it costs like $70, just to buy the entire package or something like that. So, I'm not saying I'm doing better than Toby, I'm doing cheaper than Toby. We are at an accuracy of about one centimeter, uh, which is plenty for a human computer interface, for example. So, uh, that's basically always going into that direction. I do uh, a lot of image processing, so I have to. Okay, that was the, that one. There is a lot of uh, good work on activity recognition. Very good work in the community to understand what these activities are. Really, really good work. Once again, if you don't care about the mistakes, if they don't happen very often, and if you don't have a big risk, then you're fine with that. The, the last couple of images I want to show is we are doing a lot, once again, since I believe in these guys, and these guys produce great phones, I want to see if we can improve their cameras. And, and if I improve their cameras, doesn't mean that I take a picture, upload to a server at Google, uh, and f half an hour later I get it. It means that I take a picture and real time is done here, and we have that demo here working. So that's a regular, so these guys have done a tremendous job in their camera, they often, and, and, but this is the normal picture that you will take today. Uh, this is in the Washington Loop, and this is what we produce. And for those that are seeing that processing people, to go from here to here, all we have to do is a Fourier transform. Okay? And if I tell you how we're people, all, actually I'm lying, you have to know about five Fourier transforms. Okay? Fourier transforms are done here faster than real time. For those that are not familiar, the slow motion on an iPhone is working at 240 frames a second. They're doing JP compression at 240 frames a second. Right now, on software. Fully software. On this one. When I was an undergrad, I worked on a project that ended up being an entire company that was the first company that produced JPEG on real time, on hardware for several thousand dollars. They were doing 30 frames a second VGA resolution. These guys are doing 240 frames a second on software. Okay? So it's kind of shocking. Uh, so we can do that for video as well. Um, I'm going to try to fast forward this if I can see here. And you're going to see the original on the left and the much larger on the right. I can stop at every frame and show you every single frame. Uh, basically, it's much sharper. So, those are some of these are videos taken with the phone. And, and basically, all we were saying is saying for every frame, if you do five Fourier transforms, you get a much, much sharper video. And once again, if I were to tell you that this takes half an hour, I would say to my students, go back to the whiteboard uh, or blackboard or whatever you want. Uh, because I, I don't believe in computation expensive. I, I don't believe in computation expensive because I don't think this will get to the consumer. I don't believe in computation expensive because I think that, <coughs> that correlates to complicated algorithms and I'm too old to understand complicated algorithms. 
So, so everything that, so five Fourier transforms I understand. And, and that's what we're trying to do. So, to, to conclude, uh, there has been a significant progress on big data and the examples I showed at the end of the video. Uh, I believe there's lots to be done, particularly for regular consumers that are not uh, Facebook or Google. They have all the power and all the data uh, that there is out there. And we should never forget that big data comes with tasks. It's not just in the vacuum, let's just extract. And, and David was very good at the questions that LinkedIn is asking. You know, can I predict uh, 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 the job market? Can I predict the profile of a person to get a job? Uh, uh, and that's, uh, I think, it's always the, the task. Uh, 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 the scientific community and industry are working together more and more, and that's a lot of fun because they're the ones providing the task. And I want everybody to remember that that your smartphone is your computer today. So thank you. Kind of just a general overall question is what is you feel the greatest challenge in using big data? For me, it's extracting the information. Yeah, for that means I think I'm, I might not have to say anything, but big data is not equivalent to a lot of information. Okay, and the big challenge is a, a simple questions that are very difficult to answer. You have a given task, how much data? I need for you to learn from data how to do that task. So it's very unclear for me if Facebook needed the 20 million. I actually think that they use 20 million because the algorithms are not smart enough to understand. I mean, we designed with 6,000, we so we proved that the same task can be achieved with 6,000. Completely different algorithms. So if that's a big question because data costs money and you need to, to, to pay for that. One of the other areas that I find it, uh, uh, exciting and it relates to the questions that were asked to David is basically to combine the different modalities of data. Um, and we are, the people present here and many others that do, trying to work very hard on that. And an area I don't work, uh, but, but David alluded to that, is the, the privacy issue when you start combining data. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to LinkedIn. There's not going to be a second competition. I can guarantee you now, it's going to happen the same as happened to Netflix. They're going to sue them because people are going to find a way to basically find themselves in the data that they think they gave anonymous to them. I can guarantee you that's what happened to Netflix. Netflix say all these data is all anonymized. They were sued and they had to stop the second competition immediately because people found how to de-anonymize. I was laughing the other day that we had an internal Duke questionnaire on the satisfaction of faculty. And at the end of the questionnaire, they asked demographics. And you have to understand that Duke is the number one data science place, I believe, mean, now in the country, with people in privacy like Jerry, who is the number one. And at the end, they asked all anonymous questions. Which college do you belong to? I belong to Pratt. When did you come to Duke? <laughs> I came three years ago. Each one is non identified uh, are you Latino or not? Yes. So you just identify. I'm the only Latino at Pratt in the last three years. Actually, we have a second one. So you ask a lot of anonymous questions when you combine those questions. I, of course, didn't care, and this is all internal I do. But when you start combining questions, your chances, and that's, a, I think, a big challenge of big data. And, and, and basically, we're working now with children, and we have something that I never took a class, and I think that we're going to change that with these activities we're doing. We have two consultants from ethics in our team, basically because we have questions in ethics that nobody has ever asked because of the big data. So we basically have two consultants in the field on that. And I hope in a few years every engineer will get serious classes on ethics for, for big data. Uh, and so, so, so those. The challenges of big data is we have never done it before. And that's, uh, I think, the challenge to predict. And that's what we're trying to do. The Duke is the right place. I mean, I don't think many people have 
ethics people sitting with engineers to try to understand some of our ethical concerns. And this was after IRB approved. So I'm, we're way beyond. And IRB is working with us. We're releasing what I show you for behavior. We're releasing it. And the questions there are even incredible. I am actually curious about the data fusion aspect. I was going to ask you about that because that, that is a growing area in a lot of fields. And sometimes, you know, the um, ethical concerns aside, because you know, in some areas that doesn't really matter. Uh, what um, what do you think is the state of um, of the science in, in data fusion, and particularly in fusing like that imagery with other other data types? Uh. That's a, that's a big question. It, it really depends on the discipline. So even in imaging, we need to use data from different imaging modalities. Uh, a lot of the data fusion today becomes basically, one of the challenges in data fusion is the fusion of data, which is incomplete in all the data sets. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing today. And some of the people, uh, uh, that is, is all my particular area of research, some of the people are going to basically do data fusion by doing information fusion. And that relates to things that David was mentioned before. You learn something from one data set, you learn something from another data set, you learn something from another data set. Now, let me just give you another example of that. There is a fantastic uh, team at, at Duke, uh, uh, Tammy Moffitt and Absalom Caspi. They've been tracking for 40 years an uh, uh, entire town in New Zealand. Everything uh, you want to know about these these a thousand people they have everything, and they just published a paper which I think is fantastic that was on the correlation between uh, uh, basically your economic health and your heart health, and you could think that there's a very strong correlation the healthier you are your economics. So they proved that, but they also proved that there is a very strong correlation between your IQ and your economic health, basically your score, your credit score. And, and that's a tremendous ethical question because that means that when you're going to buy a house and you give authorization for your credit score, you just get in your IQ. And you didn't know, but you just get in your IQ. Very accurately. So, how do I merge, how do I fuse those data sets without revealing that? It becomes a question for the ethics people, for the privacy, but also for the question of data fusion, because that data has tremendous value. Fuse, I'm fused. Yeah, I have the crazy scores of a thousand people. Yeah, just a Gaussian distribution, awesome. I can compare it with the crazy scores in Durham. Yeah, we more or less have, both have Gaussian distributions, great. The value starts when you merge with other things. <coughs> uh, the other day we heard a lecture about a school a performance on the standardized test and the day the family received food stamps. Outstanding topic. But once again, it's combining two data sets. The food stamps are given more or less on your social security. That means I can identify more or less your kids. If I, so that was superb. I saw that graph, I said, what a fantastic piece of research. Each one of them has no value. Together, it's fantastic. Policy basically of when to distribute food stamps. So it has a tremendous contribution to society by fusing the data. So I think the, the, the challenge is just the ethics and also when missing data. I think those are big challenges. And, and there is a number of great people that do work on that. In your work on the Wikimedia Commons project, you mentioned that you Less of a philosophical question, a more practical question. Do you really think that with a $9 system, you can correct for the various lighting situations? Yeah, this is actually on dark. This was a dark. Well, but can you correct if it's very bright? I mean, is, yeah, that, this oh, is, is it? Okay, tell me your opinion of why the commercial Toby system really costs the gazillion you said it costs. I have no idea. Technology, I mean, I can do crazy things on this phone that I couldn't do. By the way, if you move. Please do this. Take the same picture with an iPhone 5 and an iPhone 6. Mm -hmm. You're going to throw your iPhone 5 to the garbage on this phone. Just that generation, the improvement in the camera is shocking. It's very bad for people like me. I knew how to improve a lot the iPhone 5. I have to work much harder for the iPhone 6. It's a tremendous camera. And just a year different. Just incredible. 
So all we had to do is apply a bunch of Fourier transforms. And they're, now they're working on that. <laughs> we actually we actually worked on that last week. Uh, but uh, so so I think it's technology improvement. It's technology. And what we are doing is also once again going back to the task. I don't want to have very accurate. Our gaze tracking is motivated by our child behavior. All what we need, we split the screen in four, we give different stimuli, and we want to know which one you're looking. So I need much less accurate things that what hobby has targeted. My task is a simpler task. If I want to go into the sub millimeter, I cannot get it. I will probably be able in a few years because real sense will get better and better. So I already have the framework. We have a pattern with Duke, and we already, we're waiting for them. But today, our task is different. Are you looking left or right? So one centimeter is plenty to do that. So. When you say the smartphone is your computer, do you, you really mean smartphone with the cloud? Or do you really do Yeah, that? I think both together. And I think that David alluded to that because that also addresses privacy. When I don't have to show the data or you don't have to show me the data, yes, with, with the cloud. But then other people like, like Robert Calderon get into the picture for communication because if I need to upload all my videos, it would be kind of communication for it. But, but yes, yes. So, uh, but what I'm saying is that for most of us as consumers, I don't have the resources that Google has. So I should be able to do a lot of things on my phone and basically go to the cloud for the things I cannot do on my phone. I cannot go all the time to the cloud because then the communication people won't be happy and the cloud people won't be happy. So the, the stuff that we're doing for child behavior, some of the analysis is done on the phone, and then you upload other things. And it's becoming interesting because our bottleneck now is that we're uploading, because we're doing so much on the phone, we end up uploading more data than if we uploaded the video. Because the results of our analysis is a lot, so we have to kind of get to a compromise that we're doing some on the phone, uploading, and then doing some on the, on the, on the cloud. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I just, I, I don't know, this is what we're all using. When uh, doing, you know, analysis and working with data where you're cross-referencing two different data sets to each other, how do you kind of deal with this technical question of causation versus correlation? Oh, I'm going to let David, if he wants to address <laughs> that question. But, uh, and if he tells you that he knows, uh, I will say that he's not telling you the truth. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually I was the other day saying, I was pinpointing a class at Columbia, exactly that topic, and I say, I say an email to David, to Robert, and to others saying, we should teach this class. It was entire about that. <laughs> uh, so David, you want to take it? I mean, you can't really. I mean, the pe people um, who work on causal inference uh, often just make up some sort of BS game for themselves, which isn't real causation. It's a tough. I recommend to everybody to watch, just because it's fun, there's an IMAX movie about the coral reef in, in, in uh, Australia dying. And it was an NSF funded uh, project to investigate why. And they, it's a happy story. So they made an IMAX uh, 3D huge movie. And, and that relates to that uh, because they actually found that it was deforestation in the Amazon. That was basically the roots were not trapping the salt anymore. So they were doing deforestation, there were no more roots, the salt was flowing all the way to Australia. And uh, then killing the coral reef, and they solved the problem by just basically putting filters before the coral reef. I mean, the real issue is like if, of the usual causal inference, if you have randomized experiments, yeah. then you can do it, but then the, these data are always observational, and so if there's observational data and unmeasured confounders, yeah. then you're not going to create a Facebook company so you can luck. run and, and yeah. optimize algorithm yeah. uh, with random samples, or go and, and do deforestation in, in Durham, so you can <laughs> prove that that works. It's just they find out and they prove the other way, they actually stop that. And it happened, yeah. And Facebook got in trouble for running experiments on it, so. They got in trouble for, <laughs> yeah, having a very not smart employee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or very smart, but not very cautious. Yeah. I had a um, yes. question about, um, uh, in terms of like the face recognition, and, um, that I've, I've seen a lot recently, like I recently had a program on um, what they called, um, it was like uh, faces in the wild or whatever, like yeah. 
taking really non-optimal, crummy pictures of faces from grainy video or from stock images. Even how, <clears throat> how would, uh, you know, this, in, at least Iarta's impression was that that was going to take 3D models of the face and really um, much more um, computationally intensive approaches than what's typically used for face recognition right now. Um, and I was curious what your take, and that's not stuff that's going to run on a smartphone, at least not today. Um, I was curious what your impression was on whether you could do facial recognition, their, their idea of facial recognition in the wild on a smartphone today, or if that's something that's still... I, do, I think you can do facial recognition on a smartphone today. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's what, you can do hours on a smartphone today. I mean, I, we, have, we don't have implemented, but you could do it. You have to distinguish between the training and the testing stage. Uh -huh. and so the training like will be done offline. Uh -huh. And you know, in the cloud, and every time you have more data, you send it to the cloud, and the cloud keeps crunching and downloads you new parameters. But you can do, uh, you know, with the with the random forest that we're doing. The random forest is the technology behind the Kinect, mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically the Kinect runs at 200 and something frames a second on the Kinect, and and that is less power than a, than a phone today. So you can do random forest. Uh, on the phone, you, it's starting to be. I actually was talking with one of the at Robert Caliban's uh, birthday party, one of the people from Qualcomm, and they're, they're implementing neural nets in their phones to prove that they can do it. Uh, so I think I think we're testing. I think we can get there, but but also because phones are becoming smarter and and, and stronger. So so we have to design the algorithm that runs. Just in many numbers at five frames a second, it will run at 30 frames a second in two years without doing almost nothing. We have to be very careful with memory and power consumption. This is what these guys work. So I give them five Fourier transform, and I say, why don't we do it all the time? They say, you know, steal power, and then people will complain that the phone runs out of battery at 7 p.m. instead of at 7.10. So power consumption is something in academia we almost don't look when we run because our computers are plugged to the wall. And then we say, oh, just don't worry, it's becoming a big constraint, power consumption and memory. Okay? Because when, when you want to store you know, 100 million images on your phone, it becomes a problem. Memory is becoming cheaper, but there is something. But power consumption is, every time I, you know, we were at Google and at Apple in the last week, and you talk and they love it, and power consumption is what industry always comes back to, power consumption. How low power is. So our face recognition, thanks to a company we're working with, has less power our, our emotion recognition less power than turning on the phone. They, they actually did a superb job. The, the, the power is an issue for the phones today. Let's thank you. I have no idea. I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm more disappointed that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs>